when, when Britain did away with slavery, because that probably would have ticked off the southern colonies as much as it ticked off the southern states when the north tried hmm. to do it. Yeah, and just to uh, kind of continue this line of counterfactuals, the big debate in the early American Republic is between the Jeffersonian and Hamiltonian visions of whether America will be a self-educated yeomanry and be farmers like Jefferson wanted or go on a model of finance, banking, manufacturing, the industrial British model like Hamilton wanted. Do you think that mm. things could have skewed more to the Jefferson side if America would have remained a colony or it would have con- – maintain a similar course of evolution? That's a little harder to say. I think New England and a lot of the northern regions were very much moving into to mercantilism and industry and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that Britain did not allow the colonies to do was develop a lot of manufacturing. Uh, there were a lot of restrictions on on what sort of factories and industries they could have because they wanted the colonies to be shipping those raw materials to England so England could have that that manufacturing. Um, if there had not been a revolution, I think industry would have probably developed in New England, but it would have evolved a lot more slowly over time. Right. And it's not as if America becomes a manufacturing powerhouse in the early 19th century. It's a very long and very prolonged process. And England is... That's true. But they were really pushed into it with independence because once they were independent, they really had... They just didn't have the stuff they needed to run a, run the country. They, they needed to develop an industry to underwrite a lot of it. And that's where New England and some of the middle colonies really started to take off with this stuff. And uh, one more <laughs> counterfactual thing, unless something bops into my head. Uh, with the abolition of slavery, uh, so the transatlantic slave trade is shut down in, what is it, the 18, 1808, 1810s? Is somewhere around there? Is that right? Yeah, I think it's 1808. Okay, 1808. I forget what policy Britain has with its colonies. Um, like any empire, they have a different set of rules at the home versus uh, elsewhere. Was there a ban on slavery within its colonies at some point? And if America had remained one, would that have moved up the date of abolition? Yeah, the uh, British allowed slavery in their colonies and actually tolerated it in England itself. People say that there were no slave laws in England, but if colonists brought their slaves back to the mother country when they were staying there for a few years, the the, the slaves remained slaves for the most part. Um, Britain started to develop its abolitionist movement in the early 1800s. And it was sometime, I believe, in the 1830s that it finally abolished uh, slavery throughout the colonies. I- interestingly, too, I, I might add, um, the abolition movement really directly grew out of the American Revolution. I'm not sure we would have seen an abolition movement either in the North or in England had there not been an American Revolution. Because the revolution really was the time that they really began to popularize the idea that all men are created equal and that there are certain inalienable rights such as liberty. And those were not universally accepted truths before the 1760s, 1770s. Those were things that America really made popular through the war. And of course, abolitionists took that to its natural conclusion. Hey, wait, all men are created equal. Well, we have all these men over here without equal rights and without basic liberties. And I think abolitionists in both England and America really took heart from those principles that were set during the American Revolution, even though they didn't, of course, live up to those principles until decades later. That's really interesting because uh, from what I know of the early abolitionists, many of them were Mennonites or Quakers. Mm-hmm. Um, that were not heavily involved in the revolutionary effort. And that might have been due to religious understandings that you have to obey and be subservient to the government installed above you based on some scriptural readings and their interpretations of that. Uh, so that's it. I, I guess, but I guess they wouldn't have seen that as a contradiction. They would believe in the universal dignity of man and universal rights, just not necessarily the rebellion part. Do I have what? that right or am I off? Um, one of one of the misconceptions, I think, is that slavery was controversial before the American Revolution, and it really wasn't. The uh, Quakers did not ban slavery within their Quaker communities until 1774. Um, there had been a growing anti-slavery movement within the Quaker community for, for a few decades before they reached that moment. But you can go back to, like, I think it was in the 1750s. Uh, I have a record of one Quaker... Uh, meeting 
that expelled a member because he was talking too much about abolition and it annoyed them. So the Quaker, <laughs> the the idea that that slavery was wrong was really not a concept among much of anyone until the decades leading up to the American Revolution. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was. For England, um, at some point after the Middle Ages, when um, there are no longer slaves within England, when the feudal model breaks down, but when enslavement begins to happen in order to have enough manpower to farm in the colonies and the Caribbean and other places, then there's this the, the moral hypocrisy or moral laundering of, well, we'll do it over there, not here, but over there. So Even though there wasn't slavery in England, it was very much uh, the notion that um, you were born into a certain life and you would live that life. And there was very little chance that you would ever deviate from that life. If you, if you were born uh, the son of a farmer, you would become a farmer. If you were born the son of a blacksmith, you would become a blacksmith. Um, if you were born the son of a prince, well, lucky you. But yeah, it, there was not an idea of that we're all free to choose our path for ourselves. Um, you, you were born into a station in life and you lived in that station in life. And, and, Slavery was an extreme extension of that, but that was um, not – it was not antithetical to the way most British people live their lives. Yeah, I mean seeing it as a natural extension of the class system, that if you have a class system anyway, of course slavery makes sense. You're merely at the bottom of the pyramid. Right. Um, but then if you abolish slavery, then that could leave people scratching their heads of, well, that's part of our class system. So we can't just – abolish the merchant class um that, that that's how the whole system works okay yeah that's a good point uh okay so that was an interesting tangent but you know you can always pick out i i love uh, tangents like that um <laughs> yeah. so let's look uh jumping ahead um several episodes on your podcast uh, up to uh, episode 71 i believe uh where you talk about king george's proclamation of 1775 and this happens after the war started but you see it as inevitable or it uh, making independence inevitable. So how do you see that? And what was the proclamation? Shots were really first. I mean, we have a few incidents before 1775, like the, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, things like that. But shots really didn't get fired in anger between troops and civilians until Lexington and Concord in April 1775. And through this whole thing, through this this whole dispute that had really been going on for years and and, and almost no one had been killed up to this point, um, everybody thought it was just going to get settled politically at some point. They would negotiate a mutually agreeable um, uh, situation and everybody would go back to, to living as normal. And even after Lexington and Concord, a great many colonial leaders said, all right, well, now we've shown Britain that we're serious, that we're really willing to fight over these issues. Surely now they're going to come back with a compromise and we can negotiate a solution to this whole thing. Um and the way they went about trying to present a compromise to Britain was that they basically took the position that Parliament had gotten out of control. And surely the king, who is our guarantor of our freedoms and our liberties, would notice this now and that he would go to Parliament and say, whoa, guys, you've really gone too far with my colonies. We need to set up a free and fair system so that everyone's happy. Uh, unfortunately, King George was not ready to do that. He was one of the leading hawks in London who kept telling the parliament that you have to hold a firm hand over these colonies, you have to show them who's boss, or they're never going to learn. And he made a declaration in, or a proclamation in 1775 that the colonies were in a state of rebellion and that Parliament needed to come down hard on them. He made a speech at the opening of Parliament in, I think it was in October, saying that, you know, you've got to clean up this mess in, in, in the colonies and you've got to do it with military action. I think he said it's come to blows is the word he used. Uh, so that really ended all hope in America that there could be a negotiated solution to this problem and a reunion with England. And it was when they learned about that over the next few months, December, January, February, because it took time for word to get across the ocean, they really started saying to themselves, yeah, there's, there's really no way out of this but independence or a hangman's noose. 
um, one of us is going to win in a fight and we're either going to be independent or we're going to be hanged as traitors. And that's when they started really talking about a declaration of independence. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Uh, something you noted is that uh, the proclamation made independence inevitable. Now, uh, not war, but independence. By that, do you mean that America was on a course where even if it had lost the Revolutionary War, eventually at some point would have gained independence? Or do you mean independence just in the 1776 sense where they proclaimed it and then the war started? It, it, it prompted the, the the movement that universally toward independence. I mean, it got you know all the moderates on board for independence when they saw that there was no way Britain was going to back down. Of course, war had already started. We'd already had Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill by this time, um, and then captured Fort Ticonderoga, various things like that. So th there were things going on. War had started. The question was, can we quickly put a stop to this or not? I think once blood was shed, it was going to become very difficult for, for things to be resolved. Britain really would have had to come back and say, Hey, we're going to we're going to give you everything you asked for. This has really gone too far. We're sorry about all that. And and there was no way Britain was ready to do that. Uh, funny thing, what they they did come back with that in about 1778, and uh, by that time, you know, America had rejected it. If they come back with that in 1775, I think they could have avoided this whole thing. So yeah, a few years too late. But yeah, uh, I think once once war had started, and if Britain had had to put down this war in a really brutal way where they were massacring people and hanging the leaders, I think the hard feelings would have lingered for such a long time that America probably would have had a second war for independence a few decades later. It just, it, it would have happened at some point after that. Right. It would have been a, I don't want to say controlling in Afghanistan, but um, yes, you might be militarily superior, but if there's a low level insurrection that's constantly happening, then it might get to the point where you just want to cut your losses and leave. So that could have played out very differently. Well, yeah, you have to remember the whole reason Britain had colonies in the first place was to make more money for Britain. If they were going to become a financial drain where they were constantly having to spend men and treasure to, to, to maintain these foreign possessions, they just yeah, it wasn't worth it to them. Right. Cut your losses at some point. But yeah. it's, it's very conceivable, like you described, that America could have remained a colony. Canada right to the north, very similar in customs and culture and language and everything else to the United States. Australia, very similar, much more similar than India, for example, which wasn't independent until 1947. So, yeah, could have played out very differently. Yep. Uh, so uh, thanks for getting into these details and adding complexity to a bunch of issues that I think people just kind of gloss over. I'd like to telescope out and then wrap up a discussion on something that we were discussing a bit before I hit record on this podcast, and that was – the continu continuity that you see between the colonial and revolutionary period in the United States to today. I recently wrapped up a multi-part podcast series with a guest on the Civil War. And uh, the one of the conclusions we came away with is that two of the most defining wars in American history were the Revolutionary and Civil Wars. The Revolutionary War answered the question of whether or not America would be a nation. And of course, it gave us the founding documents that guide us. But the Civil War was arguably more important because it determined what kind of nation we would be. Would we continue to tolerate slavery? The balance of power in terms of national political representation moves from the South to the North. The United States is not thought of as a collection of states where presidents would say the United States are, but they would use a singular form the United States is. The... Um, pathway of Alexander Hamilton is followed instead of Thomas Jefferson of manufacturing. And you said um, you don't quite agree with that. So can you tell me what your take on that idea is? Well, I, I, yeah, I touched on this concept a little earlier, but basically the idea that the Civil War never would have happened but for the ideals of the American Revolution, that the notions of all men are created equal, the notions that there are certain inalienable rights uh, really formed the foundation of the divide that became the Civil War uh, a, a century later. Um, 
people don't understand how revolutionary the revolution really was. A lot of people say, well, it wasn't really that much of a revolution. The colonial leaders became.